voice. What is the voice? What is our own voice? What do we hear in the voices that we hear? These are questions that we're going to explore today. The Quran Sharif says that creation occurred when God said, be, and it was, kun fayakun. The divine voice said, be. And the very thunder, the very bellowing force of that word brought forth creation. Be, and it was. It was in the very saying of it, the very saying of creation brings forth all of manifestation. And in the book of Genesis, let there be light. And there was light. It began with the saying of it. it began with the voice booming, opening up worlds. In the Vedanta, there is a saying, Nada Brahma. The divine creativity is sound. Sound is the divine creativity. This world is created of sound. It all comes from the primal vibration welling up and producing this world of interwoven rhythms and tones. Sheikh Al-Akbar Mohyuddin ibn al-Arabi um, draws our attention to the nafase rahmani the, the all-compassionate breath, that great sigh, that great sigh issuing out of the eternal, issuing out of the infinite, that great loving, longing sigh from which all is made. It still blows through creation, that breath, it billows, it all comes from it. And so as breath flows out, breath carries voice, voice resounds, the cosmos is filled with a deep drone. There are many names for this drone. Sufis call it the Sauti Sarmadi, eternal sound. You hear it in the depths of the depths. You have to listen deep, deep down and you hear it. It's also called the Anahadnad. The yogis call it Anahadnad. They close their ears to hear it. It has the sound of bees buzzing and waves and the conch, all of these piercing, vibrating sounds merged in a deep, all-pervading drone that subsumes all sounds. Pythagoras called it mnemosine, or memory. It's the cosmic memory, the sum total of vibrations, the whole memory of the cosmos vibrating. The music of the spheres is memory. And it works its way out into expression through all of the lives of all of the beings of the earth. That deep sigh issuing out of the infinite, vibrating in the music of the spheres, in the sound made by the planets in their whirlings, that same sound attesting to unity finds voice in the voices of the 10,001 things. 
This was the insight of um, Sheikh Zunun, mystery of Egypt, when he said, Oh God, I never hearken to the voices of the beasts or the rustle of the trees, the splashing of waters or the songs of birds, the whistling of the wind or the rumble of thunder. But I sense in them a testimony to thy unity. He's listening to everything. He's listening to the, the animals. He's listening to the leaves rustling, the water splashing, the song. Listening carefully to every single voice, specifically. And hearing in each and every one of them a testimony. to the divine voice. How do you hear the cosmic sound? How does the divine breath resound in your being, in your life? Do you receive intimations of guidance? through hearing. There's a beautiful word, an Arabic word, that bespeaks this, and that word is hatif, hatif. The word hatif means an inner voice, the voice from beyond, the voice that guides, it's a beautiful word. And when the telephone was invented, a name had to be found for that new dev device. And the word that was chosen was Hatif. It's apt. A voice from afar. The phone suddenly rings. There's someone far away. You can't see them, but they're calling you. They're reaching out to you from the invisible. It's Hatif. That's how the Hatif works. You hear guidance. Now we have to be careful not to confuse that Hatif of guidance with all of the, you know, confused um, impulses of our conditioned, impressioned mind. In fact, the clearer the mind, the more translucid the mind, the more clearly will resound the voice of guidance. And it comes in, in different ways. Um, I find that, have you had this experience at the time of going to sleep? Maybe you remember this, especially from childhood, but maybe it continued in your later years. But have you had the experience when going to sleep, drifting off to sleep, that you start to hear a sublime music and it's not just the repetition of a song you heard earlier in the day. It's, it's the music of the angels. Something you could have never devised yourself, but it just comes over you. That music carries you into sleep. That's, that's one way that it comes. It comes at night, mostly as, as music. But sometimes it comes in another fashion in the morning. In the morning, it could come as a voice. When you're just waking up, when you're in that space between sleep and wakefulness, sometimes you'll hear a voice at that time. You hear a name or a word or a sentence. Something has been given to you. And you might, when you wake up, immediately recognize the, the relevance of it. It might answer your question. Or it might be something very mysterious. You don't know what it means. It's a name you haven't heard before. And so you just take it in and you wait and you see. 
you try to find out eventually what, what could this mean. The voice sometimes comes like that. It tells you something that you don't know yet, but which eventually you'll come to, to know. So thoughts, insights, um, communications are carried on the breath both between planes and here on this plane, between each other. We communicate each, with each other through the breath. Moshid says it's a kind of wireless telegraphy. The, the well-established current of breath is a wireless telegraphy by which you can receive messages and send messages. Moshid practiced um, breathing exercises himself uh, all of his life and constantly he was developing his breath as a musician and as a mystic and he says in in that um, practice of breath development there are three primary aspects one is the breath itself becoming conscious of your breath watching it refining it extending it but the second aspect is learning to blow the breath and this becomes important in healing also so sending out of the breath is the next step first breathing finally then learning to blow and some of the essential divine names in the sufi tradition are ones that are blown like who the zikr culminates in this the name names of blown breath. And then the third stage is that you articulate what was first breath, then blown air, and now becomes voice. And you articulate that in syllables, whether said or sung. And this way you more and more develop the art articulateness, clarity and resonance and sincerity of your breath. And it's crucial to find your own voice. This is something Moshe emphasizes again and again. We can't imitate the voice of another. We can be inspired by the way that someone else has come to inhabit his or her own voice. That becomes a, a model for us. But we've got to find our voice, not that person's voice. The voice is the greatest of the instruments. So in Indian classical music, even those who specialize in a particular instrument need first of all to learn to sing. Singing is primary, that's the, the primary instrument. It all comes back to that. And you've got to find your voice, whether you're a singer or, or not. How do you find your own voice? Because very often we, we imitate, uh, we borrow a voice from uh, those we've heard, those who have influenced us. But the real task in our life, both metaphorically and literally, is to find our own voice and live it and sing it. You might find that in different um, states of consciousness, in different um, modes of being, your voice sounds different. When you're more sincere, your voice sounds more sincere. And when you're really in your heart, in a very vivid moment, a very real moment, a very true moment, when you're speaking your heart, that comes across and you're finding your voice in that. Now, Moshe goes on to say, the person who has found out the keynote of his or her own voice has the key to his or her whole life. That person, through the keynote of the voice, can then wind his or her own being and can help others. Good to find your own voice and that can inspire others. There are, however, many occasions when this much knowledge is not enough because this knowledge only concerns oneself. One knows what is one's own note and the natural pitch of one's own voice. So Moshe is saying here, it's very important to inhabit your own voice, to realize it, to live it, to express it. 
But that's not the end. That's not all. Because then you've got to also listen to other others' voices. First realize your own voice, but also carefully listen to each and every voice. And there's so many wonderful tales of, of listening. Listening is a whole art. And it uh, radiates out in widening circles of listening so that it includes not only listening to those who speak our language, but listening to all human beings and not only human beings, animals, plants, rocks. There's no end to it. And the wonderful story is about listening to animals. Maybe you do this already. If you wake up before dawn, it's all dark. There's nothing to, to see or even to do. But what do you hear? You hear the birds heralding the coming dawn. And you listen to those birds. And there's a magic in that listening. You enter into those birds that are heralding the dawn. You listen to them in that enchanted hour. The stories of mystics who listen to the ants, such little creatures, hardly visible, but they are constantly chanting praises. The Quran Sharif says, the seven skies, the earth, and all that lies within, within them sing hallelujahs to him. There is nothing that does not chant his praises, but you do not understand their praises. Everything's lifting up its voice in praise. We've got to listen. There's that wonderful episode in the Quran in which, um, in which Solomon listens to the, the, the ant as he's marching. He's marching with all of his troops off to battle, but he has that, that uh, care, that presence of mind that his, his, his attention goes down to the ground and he hears the concerned voice of the ant who might be trampled. Actually, Hazrat Ali himself once accidentally stepped on an ant and the ant was harmed and he was distraught. He was overwhelmed by, with grief. And uh, the prophet um, reminded him to take care where he uh, s stepped and he was just beside himself with, uh, with sadness. And then the prophet conveyed this good news. He said, be of good cheer. You will be forgiven. The ant has interceded for you in the court of heaven. It was so sad to have injured that ant. But that ant asked his pardon. The ant knew that Imam Ali meant no harm and, and, and pleaded his case and he was forgiven and, and all was well. But just how, how caring, how attentive was Hazrat Ali to, to be so struck by the well-being of that, um, that teeny little ant. Mm -hmm.